like us to learn in memory of um, Barrier Wise, all of us shalom. The Shama should have an aliyah. The Levi is today at 2 o'clock, as I'm sure you've all heard about. <coughs> and uh, we wish the family a tremendous amount of chizr to help them to be able to get through this very, very difficult uh, trial. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Kite Say. Now one of the one of the amazing things that you can say about the book of Devarim, about this last book of the Torah, is that there's a very curious kind of placement of mitzvahs and a juxtaposition of different kinds of topics that come out one after the other, we get hit with a barrage of different mitzvahs, one after the other in very, very staccato format, especially to when we get towards the end of, par- of say, for Devar, like in Parsha's Kitetze. And sometimes, especially in this week's Parsha, it's very difficult to understand why the Torah places these adjacencies of one statement or one mitzvah after the other, and there seems to, they seem to be completely unrelated. Sometimes Rashi helps us understand it, and sometimes Rashi doesn't help us understand it. And I'm going to give you an example of both in, in just a moment. But one thing is clear. Chazal tell us that especially when it comes to the book of Devarim, it is appropriate to understand why the Torah creates these adjacencies, why the Torah creates these connections. There's a purpose, and that purpose has to be understood. Okay? So, if we take a look at source number one, I want to show you three mitzvahs which are one after the other in the Torah in this parsha. Mitzvah number one is Lo yihiyech li gever al isha velo yilbash gever simlas isha ki soavas Hashem alokecha kolosei eva that a woman may not wear a man's clothes and a man may not wear a woman's clothes because this is an abomination to Hashem anyone who does these things. Rashi just tells us there there could be two motives for being a transvestite, right? For wearing someone else's uh, clothes of the opposite gender. One could be that you want to try and infiltrate the camp. If you're a man wearing a woman's clothes, you may want to infiltrate the camp to try and uh, hang out with women, right? And to get chummy with women, right? And the other could be is out of a sincere desire. because you, you like the other gender. You like, you know, so whatever, whatever the reason is. But we're, I want I to focus on that a little bit more momentarily. The next mitzvah, the very famous mitzvah of Shiluah HaKain, appears immediately after the prohibition of, um, of Big Day, of Begadisha, or Begadish. It says, Ki yukarei kan sifor lefanecha, when you encounter a bird's nest, on the road, whether it's on in a tree or on the ground, whether they're chicks that have already hatched or whether they're unhatched eggs, and if the mother is there um, sitting upon her or sitting by her chicks or on top of her eggs, you may not take the mother away from her children. You must surely send away the mother, and only then can you take the chicks or the eggs, the children, so that it will be good for you and you'll have length of days. It's a beautiful mitzvah. We're not going to go in depth and analyze that mitzvah right now, but um, this is the second mitzvah in this series of three. The third mitzvah is Kisivne Bayis Chadash V'yasisa Ma'akeh Legagecha. When you build a new house, you are obligated to build a parapet, a protective wall, on your roof. So that you don't place blood on your house, in a figurative sense, by allowing people to go on your roof and fall down accidentally and, and die, God forbid. So um, you are obligated to protect that from happening on your property, so put in the proper measures to make sure that people don't fall off your roof. Okay? So those are the three mitzvahs. So first, I'm going to take suggestions from the floor. Who can tell me what the common link between these three mitzvahs are? This is a real toughie. You really got to think about this. <coughs> any 
anyone want to make a suggestion? Uh, don't wear clothes of the opposite gender, send away the mother bird, and build a fence around your roof. What in the world is the connection between these three? Yeah, let me hear. So the first one would be if men and women are created differently and that's the way it should be accepted. The other is that a mother protects their the mother protects the children. And the third is also protecting life in some way and and um, and uh, the nature that that accidents may happen and that's it could be a natural thing that something like that could, could happen, except that as Great, great. Okay, I'm going to actually confirm your thesis. I, I believe that as well, that that's what the Torah's message is over here. Just I'm going <laughs> to present this slightly differently, but I think you're on the right track. It's excellent what you just said. So let me just, um, I'll just reiterate what Marge has just suggested, but we're going to take a little detour before we get to that. If you take a look at Rashi, Rashi tells us what the reason for the last two mitzvahs being adjacent to each other. He says, Kisiv nebayis chadash, when you build a new house. So Rashi's question is, why does this mitzvah come after the mitzvah of Shiluach HaKain of sending away the mother bird? So Rashi says, In kiyamta mitzvah Shiluach HaKain, sof chalivnos bayis chadash, usakayim mitzvah ma'ake. If you send away the mother bird, God says, I will reward you by granting you enough wealth to be able to build a new house. And then when you build your new house, you'll build a parapet around the, the roof. Shemitzvah goreres mitzvah. That one mitzvah engenders the next. V'sagiyah lekerem v'sadeh v'labigodim na'im. And then eventually you'll have the ability, the wherewithal, to buy a new vineyard and a new field and new clothes. And that's the following mitzvahs having to do with the laws of vineyards and not wearing shatnas and stuff, and stuff like that. And lekach nismichu parshios halalu. And that's why these mitzvahs were stuck together. So you'll note that Rashi only tells us why the mitzvah of Shiloh HaKain and Ma'akeh are connected, but he doesn't tell us why Beged Isha and Shiloh HaKain are connected. So <coughs> should we complain to Rashi? Should we write a letter to, to, uh, to Rashi's publisher and say, why did you only explain the connection between two and three and not between one and two? The answer is no. And the first, we really have to, we'll just touch on this briefly, we have to appreciate what Rashi's project was. Rashi's project was not to make sure that we understood every single um, hole in the, in, in the Torah. Because if that were Rashi's project, he would have written a much longer commentary. Rashi's project is to integrate the simple understanding of the text with Torah Shabbat Alpha, with an oral tradition. So any time Rashi finds a medrash or a gemara or a quote that helps clarify the text, he will use that in his commentary. And if there is something that just needs simple under explanation, he will clarify that even if he doesn't quote from a from a from a Torah Shabbat Pes source. However, if Rashi is aware of a deep, profound thought, but it doesn't fit in in that project that we've just outlined. Rashi does not include it in his commentary. So I'm sure Rashi had his own explanation as to why the mitzvah of Begadisha and the mitzvah of Shiloh HaKain are connected, but because that deep thought did not fit into his project of bringing out Torah Shabbat al as a way of explaining the simple <coughs> understanding of the text, he did not include it in his commentary. Am I, am I making myself clear? So it's not a complaint against Rashi. It's just that this was not part of Rashi's project. He was, when you go to a hardware store, you don't ask if they have a dozen eggs. Rashi, you go to Rashi for the Torah Shabbat Peh explanation of the Pshat. You don't go to Rashi to get an answer for every question that you have on the Chumash. Okay? So, but that doesn't mean that we're off the hook. Just because it wasn't part of Rashi's project doesn't mean it can't be part of our project. So let's take a look at the Sefer HaChinuch, 
um, which helps us understand every mitzvah. And a mitzvah 545, which is the mitzvah of Shiloh HaKain, uh, the Sefer HaChinuch says, and we're just quoting here, the mitzvah is to send away the mother from the nest before you take her offspring. As it says, you shall surely send away the mother, and then only afterwards may you take her offspring. So we'll just read the underlying sections of the Sefer HaChinuch over here. It says, The root, or the deeper meaning, as to why God gave us this mitzvah, is Loseis el libenu. Is to remind ourselves that God's providence, the fact that God is taking care of every single component of creation, <coughs> is in a very, very specific way when it comes to human, the human species. As it says that God's eyes are constantly on everything that human beings do. But when God deals with all other species of, of creation in this world, including the animal kingdom, God is also very concerned about the, uh, that everything should be maintained as he created it. He doesn't have the same level of what we call hashkacha pratis on animals, which means that he's not concerned that that particular um, little uh, ant in your backyard should continue living. But he's concerned about ants in general and to make sure that the ant colonies around the world are continuing and are healthy, that God is concerned about. And if we continue, and he writes that, that when a person thinks about this, and, he, and, and this is the whole idea of sending away the mother bird, is that I am compassionate and caring about the bird kingdom in general, meaning that I realize that Hashem wants to make sure that birds continue, all species of birds continue properly, and therefore I can't do anything that will disrupt the natural order of the bird, birdness of these birds. Therefore, when a person thinks about this, uh, he'll understand the, the ways of God. He'll see that God's preservation of the world, sort of God is the ultimate environmentalist, he's the God's a preservationist. God preserves the world in the way that he created it, and that species simply don't, in general, as a general rule, there are ex exceptions, but in general, the, the larger species don't just die off. So, and this is true from the lowliest of creations, which he calls the eggs of lice, until the great horns of the great re'em animals, which are these great... Um, um, legendary beasts that are the largest animals on the uh, largest mammals on the world in the world from the day of creation that God has been maintaining and controlling all of the animal kingdom in a very very steady state fashion from the time of creation until today and that's what a person is supposed to be thinking about when he does the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird I'm helping to preserve the natural order of birds and of course this species of birds by doing my contribution to make sure that this mother will be able to continue on with her life and not be so distraught when she sees her children being taken away. Okay, that's the simple understanding of the mitzvah of Shiloh HaKeh. And we can understand therefore if we look at the last two psukim of the book of Yonah when God is um, rebuking the prophet Yonah at the very end of the story, you know, what we, we're going to read it on Yom Kippur, God um, um, approaches and reproaches Yonah, and he says to him, you know, um, you didn't care about the people of Nineveh. And to illustrate this point, that you should have cared about the people of Nineveh, because after all, they're all my children, God says. God builds or constructs for Yonah something called a kikayon. A kikayon is this plant that grows very rapidly, and it, God makes a very hot day, and Yonah is very happy that his, he has this very leafy kikayon plant that he can rest under its shade. And then, all of a sudden, God causes the kikayon to shrivel up and die. And it gets Yonah very aggravated. So this is a lesson that God gives to Yonah. So the last three psukim of Yonah go as follows. 
are you really upset over the loss of this kikayon? And Yonah says, yeah, you better believe it. He says, I'm upset to the point of death. It's really, really vexing me that this kikayon plant is no longer in part of my life. God said, you really cared about this kikayon plant, but you didn't do anything to bring this plant into existence. You didn't even have to cultivate it. It was here one, uh, just, just a night ago, and now 24 hours later it's disappeared, or maybe even less than 24 hours. It just disappeared immediately. And yet you still care about it so much. So I should not care about Ninveh, the great city. That there are more than, um, than 12,000, two times 12,000, 24,000 people. There's more than 24,000 people in that city. Asher lo yada ben yiminolis These people don't know between their right and their left. So you have to have some compassion for them for their ignorance. So I shouldn't care for them. And, and the last two words of Yonah. Uvehema rabah. And after all, I got lots of animals. So those last two words of Yonah sort of, huh? You, you scratch your head. What are those last two words doing in that passage? Those last two words, uvehema rabah. Like, why does God include the fact that there are lots of animals in the city of Nineveh. I mean, if God, if there are lots of people in the city of Nineveh, so surely if God's going to spare Nineveh for the sake of the humans, why do you have to say that I have to spare it for the sake of the animals? And I think is that that's precisely what the mitzvah of Shiluah HaKain is trying to convey, that Hashem's concern and His providence over His creation doesn't just extend to human beings, to human beings. it extends to more than just human beings, it extends to His, to his animal creations as well. And so, Yonah, why would you think that I would just so easily be ready to discard and write off an entire city to the point where you weren't even interested in doing my bidding to try and rehabilitate the city? Don't you realize that I care about everything that's in that city, including the animals? And that's a very powerful message. And so I think with this in mind, if we wanted just to provide, <coughs> we've already seen a reason why building a parapet is important and why it's created adjacent to the mitzvah shuluch hakein. It's the, your reward that God gives you blessing in this world so that you can do more mitzvahs. So when you do the mitzvah of shuluch hakein, you'll get to build a parapet around your new house. But the connection between Begadish and shuluch hakein is like Marge was saying, this might not have even been such a sociological phenomenon in the times when the Torah was given. But today we see it all the time. People sometimes wake up one morning and they decide I'm a man in a woman's body or I'm a woman in a man's body. And they think that God made a mistake. God made a mistake. I don't belong in this body. And that's a terrible feeling to have and it's a horrible feeling to have and we have to have compassion on people who feel that, that they, they, don't, they don't feel comfortable in their own skin. That's a terrible feeling to have and we should be compassionate to those people. But at the same time, what the message that Shiloh HaKan is telling us is, as the Sefer HaChinuch says, don't you think that God's got him under control? Don't you think that Hashem has taken a careful inventory <coughs> of every single human being that exists? And if you are this way, it's because Hashem wants you to be this way. And as <coughs> tortured and tormented you may feel, but you can't say that God made a mistake. He knows what he's doing. And the myth of Shiloh HaKain is really specifically just that message that we have to acknowledge that Hashem has a plan and that everything he brings into existence is for a purpose and so by trying to cross dress you are uh, you are subverting that idea, you're subverting that message because you're basically suggesting that no God got it wrong and I need to I need to change things so I think that's a that's why Rashi didn't want to necessarily tell it to us because it's a bit, it's an important message but it's a it's a little bit deeper than what the shot of the of the psukim are trying to convey but it's no no less important when we think about life and we think about everything that occurs to us in life sometimes there's a temptation to say like Eo is quoted as saying to God God maybe you made a mistake. When Eov was going, undergoing all of his tribulations, the Gemara records that he said to God, you know, my name is Eov, it's not Oyev, because the word Oyev means enemy, and my name is Eov. They're very easily 
confused. Maybe God just got a little confused and you transposed the Yud and the Vav in my name and you got it wrong. And God says to him, do you realize how delicate the balance of creation is? Do you realize how careful I am, how precise I am with every single component of creation? <coughs> if I can take care of the lowliest of creatures and the loftiest of creatures and make sure that every single animal in the, in the animal kingdom survives, do you think I would make a, such a silly mistake between Eov and Oyev? That in itself is the heresy of, the, of what God was accusing Eov of and what God was trying to rehabilitate Eov from, trying to relieve him of that false belief. And that's really one of the one of the underlying messages of Sefer Eo. So we have to accept God's judgment even when it doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't make sense to us, but it makes sense to him. He knows what he's doing. Okay, have a good day, everybody. Thanks for coming.